doing this for yourself. This shit's good. But yeah, yeah you got to go into dry sift with the mentality that the yields are going to suck and, and you're going to work hard to figure it out and it might take you a long time. So if you have a lot of material, go for it. But if you're the type of dude that has like a, a half a pound of, of material and that's all you got and you want to make sift with it, I'd probably prefer you learn how to make water hash just because it's yeah. more fail safe. You know what, it also is big time, the, the material. That kid just happens to be the kid that has the fire. Everyone thinks they have the fire until they try to make full melt dry sift, and then they're like, what, what's going on here? This isn't right. Like, why doesn't mine look like yours? Rob, would you like to take that question? <laughs> why doesn't mine look like yours? Top, middle, the red. Yeah, okay, let's go. Hi, can you guys hear me? Welcome. My voice is really bad today. I've got a cold, so <clears throat> I'm not sure how this is going to work. Cuban, that was exactly right. You know, you, if you don't have a whole bunch of good product to work with, don't don't even get started. I mean, you can do a little experiment to see what's possible, but you won't really get a lot of joy unless you've got a lot to work with. So, yeah, a lot water of hash is very efficient. Back to the old techniques, it's really efficient. So, yeah, and so it's a lot easier for people. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like um, another thing I wanted to touch up on. Well, not only do I get like almost double the yields of water hash, so it kind of it's like, but the quality of like the forty five that you make into rosin comes out as an actual desirable nice yellow oil. Now the thing that I've realized with keef, like if I if you just tumble a shit ton of keef and you press it into rosin, it never is going to be the same color as water hash rosin. So it's going to be a little darker. More, I don't know, just lower grade, I would say, right? So I asked uh, somebody, and what they told me is that the oil and the pressure, it can actually leach contaminants on the way out, like chlorophyll and stuff like that, and taint the color of the rosin. Not necessarily green, but it won't be a cellophane clear yellow or almost translucent uh, no color rosin, right? But when you get a, so when you make the sift, the only way to get a rosin the same color and comparable to water hash is that you gotta make it 99. Now why would you ever press 99% dry sift into rosin? I've done it before, it's kinda of dumb. Don't, you know, let's just smoke the sift, it's better. But the water hash, when you got 45, it's almost like that 45 is pure, as it is. It makes beautiful oil. The 73 does too, and all the grades above in all those bags. Um, so yeah, if you don't have a lot of material, you get a lot more for your money, higher grade. Hey, you guys are sounding like a bunch of a bunch of glue heads, man. <laughs> yeah, if you're, tasting, if you're tasting more than is naturally there, you're using too much, uh, aren't you? If it's masking it's everything under it, and well, that who's it's say? already good, and you turn it into purple punch. I mean, and then is that to say that we, because we extracted the resins that we were doing too much, and that it was naturally only supposed to be done the way nature intended? Well, you're, no, I'm not saying only is the way nature intended. <laughs> there was a reason for curing weed. There was a reason for for treating it towards being a finished product rather than just jumping cue and making things out of fresh weed. Well, that's, my that's, voice is messed up because I got you know cannabis cup long again or something. But I've been trying to stay away from this stuff. But I mean, really. I think I think the fact that Tony's curing the terpenes is important, that he's not just capturing them fresh frozen or whatever or, or fresh and then and then putting them out on the market. He he cures them out and they change the same way they do on the plant or in the hash in the vial. Okay, that can be too, but let's leave Tony out of this. I was talking about the just the general concept of what you guys are talking about. I was forgetting you're talking about Tony's product. But let's leave products out of this and initiate sure. people out of it for the moment, unless they want to speak up. You know, he's not here this morning. So it, I just don't see this. It's fascinating, but it can really be overdone like anything, you know. And, and not all terpenes are good. There's a reason we aged our weed. It became more smokable after a few weeks or months, depending on how you did it. You could also ruin it, but you could make it, better from the point of view of smoking, you know, and, and it is a smokable product. Now you're talking about vaporizing, but mm. I'm not a big fan of that either, you know, call me old school, but, you know, 
It's not where I'm at about this stuff. So I kind of challenge the overuse of it, is all I'm saying. Well, I'll, this is what I'll say against that. I have a lot of faith in my bioassay ability, and I've been a purist for a long time, and I'm not into things that generally aren't good for me. I've, I've been the one that me away from things for years that I just felt like, you know what? You made that with a weird chemical solvent, and you don't know if you cleaned it all out. I think it would pass. And uh, because I've, I've tried those things and felt sick from them, gotten headache, and turned green. And so all I know about this is it is amazing. I mean, I'm telling you, I fucking love it. I really do. I, what about you, Cuban? I want more, man. And I might be a turp head. I was, I'm, I'm not a glue head, but I'm a turp head. Straight up. <laughs> now, if I put it like this, though, if I have hash that is like, Terpy naturally, the way it comes, I won't I won't mess with it. You know what I mean? But it's just it's an interesting product to me to see that somebody can extract the the terpen, terpenes or smell the taste the essence of the plant into a little vial. You know what I mean? Like that was just cool to me. And hey, to well, be able to... perfumery is an amazing amazing field of research. You know no, that's what you're totally... talking about there. And and. Uh... Does anybody still have any of the Swiss flavoring oils left? Like I'd like to see somebody that really put that heavy, terpene that, extract on the That green heavy stuff? Yeah, stuff that uh, the guys have for Switzerland 10, 12 years ago. I don't think I have any little Yeah, I don't have stuff. any more of that. I used but to. But I'd like to see what love. that natural cannabis extract from, at the best, Ropa Dope. It wasn't really hemp, but it was hybrid stuff. And see what that would do as an experiment. I'd also like to see somebody take hops cones, yeah. shake all the resin glands off of them, put some, some BHO that's just pure THC on there, that's easy enough to, to get, and close to pure THC, and then start experimenting with different terpenes off the shelf on some neutral mater material like that. Are we really after the terpenes, or are we after a complex mix of things? What are we after? I, I and, think that and let's have some double-blind experiments. I met with Dave Pate last night. I hadn't seen him in years. Dave's a really smart guy, and he's not necessarily buying this terpene thing at all. And and I'm I'm behind him on this too. There's been no science. I'm not. I'm with you guys. I like it too. Okay, let me back up here a little bit. But let's do these things right. Let's do a little science. Let's get a double blind experiment that shows these effects. The only thing that's been done is cursory work by David and me and a few other people. And, and, and we kind of launched this whole thing in a way. But it's time to do some serious experimenting and see what's really going on. The problem is that it's, it's a circular problem. We know what to expect in terpenes, so that's what we get. And that's what we portray back onto how, what we expect from terpenes, which is what we get. And it's, it's not scientific. No. It's satisfying. But it's not scientific. So I'd really like to see some better work with this is all I'm, I'm bucking for. And in the meantime, take it easy with these things. None of them have been approved for, for ventilating, for, for breathing. They're, they're not really approved for that. Just because terpene compounds like bergamot oil are allowed to stick on cigarettes doesn't mean they did any research. just means they wanted to sell cigarettes. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing here to tell us that this is safe. There's nothing here to tell us that it's effective. So... We all self-titrate well. Mark's but exactly can, right. He's got his radar up. That way for, for, sol for extracts, for solvent and solventless extracts. And, I mean, I looked at the terpene um, results in the Emerald Cup, and hopefully Alec will be here soon to talk about those results. He's with SC Labs. Um, he, um, they, t they tested the milligrams per grams of the terpenes, and many of the strains were as high as, as ones that had terpenes added but they never had terpenes added. They were just a really rich, full terpene producing plant uh, that got made into an extract the right way to preserve those terpenes. So what I'm saying is, why not the worry for all these years that people have been inhaling butane solvent extracts, water extracts with potential uh, microbials? What, why haven't we, you know, 15 years ago said, let's do the science on that? Why just now with terpenes? Well, you know, can I interject something? Because I'd like to ask Rob this. And is there, 
in a sense, are there mechanisms in the chemical makeup of cannabis that combat us being exposed to light mold on import quality Mexican or Colombian? Because God knows when we were getting brickweed, you know, it didn't grow brown. <laughs> that oh. was it, you know, rotting. So obviously we were exposed and we were all lighting our bowls with our big lighters and, you know, someone from a lab, I think it was Addison, told me that that's got a trail of 8,000 ppm butane coming off of a low temp flame lighter when we stick it in our bowl. And, you know, and, and, and I think Mark has a great question. What, is there things in cannabis, chemicals in cannabis that could have kind of buffered that exposure to toxicity? Absolutely. Right. And if you have any faith at all in whole plant medicines and whole plant healthcare products, the answer, of course, is yes. I mean, a complex herbal remedy or complex herbal smoking mixture, whatever you want to call it, is, is going to have compounds that may very well hurt you, but very well, may very well protect you as well. All you've done by making BHO is take an extract of the glands of cannabis. What about the other 90%? You know, I mean, whole, whole herbal healing people who are largely behind what is supposedly going on with medical cannabis are in shock about extracts like this. I mean, they're whole plant extracts, sort of, but there's no chlorophyll. There's no hardly, there's nothing that isn't either butane or CO2 soluble. So, your techniques are limiting how much is in there. You're not doing anything near a whole plant extract. So, of course, you're missing out on the possibilities that there are things there that are going to ameliorate the effects of smoking cannabis. That cannabis smoking in its raw form hasn't been bad for people. Is amazing. Smoking is bad. <laughs> Tars are bad. Cannabis smoking is good. This is fantastic. I mean, it seems to be what we're looking at right now so far. The answer would be why, you know, and it's a whole plant experiment that we've done so far. This is a shunt from that. Water hash is really a whole plant extract in a lot of ways. The gland heads are in there, you know, they're part of the, you have some bits of leaf stock, if you will. It's, it's still much more closer to a whole plant extract than solvent extracts are. Well, sure. That's the beauty of solvent extracts, too. Rob, I was going to ask about my deadly allergy to hemp and the sub-allergies I have to cannabis and what could be missing why I'm not allergic to oils. I'm allergic to dry sift. I'm less allergic to water hash. I'm deadly allergic to the flower rosin, but I'm not allergic to solvent extracts. So the hmm. argument goes both ways because when you fractionally distill an oil into all its fragments and you see how many of them are when superheated become noxious, a whole plant extract where you're going to cook that all down, I'm like, I will not pour the terpene burnt content back into your THC and call that whole. I just took it out and I can see that I want it out of my room. Because once those terpenes were heated, they all changed and they might not all change for the better. If I was trying to standardize a product versus every time I throw weed in, it's terpene explosion soup and it's never the same. Right, I can see that. I'd say, Horatio, you're a unique case. I mean, most people don't need to refine their cannabis so that it doesn't give them allergic responses. You're close to a unique case. First time I've ever read this, but I so for you, so. it's perfectly appropriate. To I thought so, too, until I started looking up adverse, like, emergency room reactions to hemp protein. Then it starts showing up in the comments. Then people are like, what the fuck are you talking about? Hemp is not allergic. I almost died. I had a tablespoon of hemp protein. And it was like getting kicked in the stomach for four hours every four minutes with a spike. So like you're saying, you have an allergy to the plant. There's something, most protein, most allergies are protein-based, so probably something like that in there. You're not going to have, I'm not a doctor, but, you know, it's, you don't extract proteins in oils. So obviously whatever protein you're allergic to, unless you have chunks of micro bacteria in there or something or other, and there's proteins in those, but you can get things that are small that have protein in them, but not cannabis proteins, so that would make sense. And water sift would still have it because it's got the head cells in there, and they have their cells, so they have proteins running around in them. Trace, tiny amounts, but for allergies, as you know, it doesn't take but a molecule really sometimes, so yeah, it's interesting. So for you, it's perfectly appropriate, and so would be a 
pharmaceuticals made from synthetics. I mean, as far as just trying to seek relief, I would think that they wouldn't cause the allergy program problem. But uh, okay, so yeah. it's a protein. That's what I figured because I looked at why. Well, right not, not necessarily. It could okay, be another necessarily. Yeah. It's something that's not coming out in oil. Could be another organism. Could be another organism that lives on cannabis that he, that his body looks at as an attacking organism, and through an allergen antigen response, mast cell degranulation occurs, and he has an allergic response. Hey, Rob, what's up with the Phylos project? Ah, uh, the Phylos project. We we presented. Uh, Mowgli Holmes, the, the head of Phylos Bioscience, and I presented uh, um, a workshop at the Emerald Cup. And basically I covered the, the new taxonomy a little bit and tried to explain how it uh, presents a model for us trying to figure out the evolution of cannabis, a hypothesis to hang, a, to hang real data on. And Mowgli's project is looking at the genetic sequences, the genome sequences of so far, about 1,500 uh, dispensary samples, and seeing how they're interrelated. This is, is part of the uh, project. And now what I've been looking for, along with uh, Sam the Skunk Man, is uh, getting samples of landrace varieties, the basic building blocks that were used to make the, uh, the Cincimedia varieties we have today, the hybrid Cincimedia varieties we have today. And once we have these older samples from the 70s, from before, from the very early uh, homegrown varieties, pre-Afghan, pre, uh, pre uh, broadleaf drug varieties, then we'll be able to put a time sense on this and see some of the beginning of the evolutionary ideas, um, corroborating some of the history we know. But it'll be interesting to, to be able to click on your sample, for instance, in the database and see how it's related to other samples in the database and how it was related to ancestrally. See if your hybrid variety has Thai or Colombian or Afghan and things like that in it. So that's the type of thing that uh, one of the things you can do with this sort of genome data. And that's, that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the evolutionary questions. It might also, genome work might also be really interesting for terpene breeding because terpene breeding is difficult, at least in comparison to cannabinoid breeding. Cannabinoids are basically a linear chain of, of synthesis. You have cannabidiol that, and THC. They're both from the same precursor. That's about the only split in the pathway that we deal with in a, on a daily basis. We know the enzymes for each of these steps. There, there are multiple alleles of some of these uh, enzymatic steps, but they're pretty well understood. They're easy to breed for. Um, Potency is super easy to breed for. You're breeding for one, one allele and, and, and against another allele. So it's just, it's very simple. But uh, terpenes are much more complicated. They start with a number of uh, basic molecules. They have ramified pathways controlled by lots of enzymes. And more importantly, there are lots of changes in the synthesis that are non-enzymatic. They happen due to heat and time and things like this. So it, it's... It's just a much more difficult thing to deal with. And I think we see sweets of terpenes come through in breeding, but they would be analogous to uh, one branch of this complicated uh, synthesis, biosynthesis pathways. And those seem to be pretty reproducible in varieties. But we've also lost lots of unique aromas over the years. Every breeder has. You see it pop up once, and it, you breed that plant, and it's just gone. You know, and it's, it's that. And, and, and then, of course, you have many, many terpenes instead of just a few cannabinoids in any variety. So an aroma, the things that you're appreciating particularly, or the effects that come from a suite of terpenes, not just one or two, that's another aspect when you're trying to apply what you've bred to what you've got and how you use it and how it affects patients or, or uh, other users. So, yeah, it's really complicated. So breeding can help with this. If you give Genetics can help with this. You give us... Uh, Markers for some of these terpenes that we'd be particularly interested in, rare ones, for instance, be able to screen huge populations without growing them to maturity, all kinds of advances for uh, breeding due to genome work. 
So maybe terpenes on your phone. Is there one you're focusing on initially, a particular genetic? No, not at all. I'm I'm only interested in the evolutionary uh, pathways and what's really happened to make uh, cannabis what it is today, and try to tie that into the human relationship with cannabis. That's that's my interest really. But, uh, How far do you think man has been using cannabis in conjunction? How long has man been using cannabis? Humans? Yeah. Uh, at least, at least since the beginning of the Holocene epoch, 12,000 years ago, 10, 12,000 years ago. I mean, how much before that? Really hard to say. There's, there's uh, cursory evidence. Maybe some of the fiber evidence that's been found is actually cannabis, but there's no proof that it is. But probably in the previous warm periods, before the Pleistocene, the last ice age, cannabis was used as well. But we don't really have any evidence of it. Have have you um, read Michael Pollan's book, The Botany of Desire? Uh, yeah, I kind of had a hand in writing at least the cannabis chapter. Sure. I, I figured you would. It, it was kind of an interesting book. The way he goes back with humans and looks at these important relationships, these plants that we've taken with us and sort of popularized through our relationship with them. Yeah, I think, and he got a lot of mileage out of that. It's it's a uh, accessible narrative, well written ethnobotany which is a field that most people don't know much about, you know, and, and it's the relationship of ethno, humanity, with botany, with plants, and, it, and it's, it's like geography, it's one of these sort of all-encompassing fields, There's, they all tie together, there's ethno, geography, and geographical botany, so they're, they're all related, but they're, they're cool fields, and what he did was make this accessible to, to a lot of people, and not just, I mean, cannabis was sort of the gateway plant of the four chapters, I suppose, but, you know, potatoes and tulips and apples are important, too, and they all told the same story of how humans interact with plants and vice versa, so that's, of course, a great book. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah. Another, another thing to build on uh, what Rob's saying is, you know, you have the flavor of the resin heads that are being produced. I've also noticed, you know, with breeding and growing out large populations, the plant material has a distinct flavor as well. I mean, I've found strains where uh, the resin smells really good. The plant's growing really great. I harvest the buds. They smell like what I want them to, but the herb doesn't smoke right, and I grew that clone several times after that. And the herb just has a, a poor flavor. Or I've, I've gotten strains that uh, produce, like, little tiny little black embryos uh, in it, you know, and, and those are just, like, you know, I, I grew some, like, land-raised Cambodian stuff, and it's like, they're not seeds, but they're these little, little tiny things, and they, they'll crackle and stuff, and there's all these, um, you know, not only is there the terpenes that are going to be, and, and we're not, you know, uh, extracts aside, of course. Um, when you're breeding for a plant that tastes good, when you smoke the herb, it's the, the terpenes that are growing on the plant and everything, but also the, how the plant material tastes can have a, a good or bad influence, in my experience, as well. Yeah, makes sense. Oh, Rob's muted. You gotta unmute Rob. It's it's the other ninety percent of the plant besides the resin. So of course it's gonna have um, its own flavors and tastes, and like any vegetable matter, it's not yeah, all. Some, some are gonna be good, and some are gonna be bad. Yeah. yeah. I hate those little tiny nubs in some uh, varieties. They're largely gone from our seed seed varieties. But back in the day, you'd get a You'd think, man, I got a seedless bud. You can't get those things out there like little pyramids. They don't roll out like seeds. They're oh, they taste just as bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not. It's not fun, especially when you get a plant that has the terpene. You know, like the herb smell. You're like, oh, oh yeah. And then you break it up, and you're like, okay, this is this is totally fucked for smoking herb from it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just uh, someone just told me I sound stoned, and I said, "Well, I hope so. I've been working at it all morning, <laughs> trying my best." Hey, Rob, have you ever heard of this compound called hashishine that this French group has uh, isolated? No, I haven't. Wow, oh, it's it was fascinating paper. I mean, again, we had talked about this in Hash Church about how the, a lot of the terpenes, again, undergo all kinds of um, thermal rearrangements, especially when you heat them up. So, you know, again, what you see in the GC and what you see at room temperature might be two very, very different things. And so 
This group in France, uh, this is a really fascinating paper. I think I put the link in the chat here. Identify um, this compound in, in several different samples. In fact, in fact, it was in all of the samples that they tested. And it's a 5,5-dimethyl-1 vinyl bicyclo-2-1-1 hexane. It's a very interesting structure. And when, when I look at it, it doesn't look like something that would be um, stable even at, um, you know, at nail temperature or even, even at rosin making temperature. And I'm wondering if this thing's actually polymerizing in some way to make some sort of polymerized version of this terpene. Uh, it's a very interesting, you know, terpene. It's pretty rare. It's not widely reported on in the literature. And until this group in France um, uh, reported on it. I, I had not really heard of it coming from cannabis at all. So this is a group um, in, in, in France that's basically reported this as being a volatile constituent from many different samples that they've looked at. I, I'd never seen it before until this week. I was just wondering if you've ever seen it. No, I haven't. Um... Yeah, I haven't seen it. That's interesting. I'd like to um, to know more about it. It's a terpenoid, huh? Yeah, it's a, it's basically it's a thermal, and they've actually come up with mechanisms to account for not just this compound, but several others that are found um, that they found by by their GC analysis. Let me um, post the link here so you can be looking at the paper. Maybe that, while I think what will happen. I mean the. The labs look from for from probably eight to maybe thirty terpenes now that the labs can find. They're all the named terpenes. They're the ones they can find standards for. They're the easy ones. Um, we've done analyses with with uh, perfume labs also in France years ago, and they come up with fifty, sixty terpenes, and that are named. And then a whole lot of just numbered retention time peaks that they don't have names for. And there's lots and lots of terpenes that don't don't have uh, names from their source plant or whatever. And I'm sure the harder we look in cannabis, the more we're going to find. And some possibly unique to cannabis, although none have been found yet that I'm aware of. But. That's, that's my real question. I mean, cannabis has this unique ability to smell like almost every other plant on the planet, right? I mean, you got pine, you got fruits, you got almost everything out there. It's how does it do that, right? How is, you know, how is, when... Most oranges all smell like oranges. There's no blue blueberry orange or like skunk orange or you know whatever it may be. It, it may be possible, but you know the people have done a lot of breeding with other plants as well and haven't really gotten such a wide range of of terpenes. And it's just uh, it's amazing to me that it I, this plant's got to have unique ones to it because there's plants that smell like nothing else too. There's cannabis plants that are unique to cannabis in my experience. Yeah, I mean those are manifestations that happen at the genetic level that like Rob said, you know, what the genes do is the genes express proteins and the proteins are essentially the cellular's uh, machinery that basically produces, I mean proteins are enzymes but they're also structural in nature and they're basically creating all the compounds including the terpenes and the cannabinoids and, and you know like Rob said, the unique thing about about uh, cannabis in terms of um, its its terpenoids is that it's got this um, CBGA synthase which prenylates allotolvic acid which is a very unique sort of you know bond formation in in the plant kingdom and that sort of creates the the cannabinoid pathway um, but you know be that as it may um, terpenes are 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 ubiquitous they're they're in all the fruit and food that we eat. I mean, people are like, you know, we can't get good terpenes on the East Coast. Well, just open up your refrigerator. They're in there. Um, they're everywhere. There's no reason why Mother Nature would make a unique set of phytochemicals for one plant and not use them economically throughout the plant kingdom. So, I mean, terpenes are everywhere. They're the same terpenes that are in mints and the same terpenes that are in a lot of different varieties. It's just the mixture of those terpenes, it's like um, each individual molecule you could think of as an instrument and the different music that the orchestra plays, which is what we end up feeling, is 
a function of the ensemble of a many, many different compounds and how they work together and how they work with our individual receptors in our bodies. It's not just individual one single terpene. That's why I always laugh when you know people say pure terpenes. There, there's no such thing as pure terpenes. Terpenes are such a wide class of molecule. The molecules we're talking about is such a very, very small fraction of you know phytoterpenes that are derived from cannabis and alike. It's such a very, very small fraction of the total uh, terpenes. It's like fungi. I mean, they have their own goddamn kingdom. There's a huge collection of terpenes that don't resemble anything like what I right. in cannabis. And if you try to dab those, you'll probably get really sick. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a question then, because this is something that I get asked all the time, and it's, is, are, are, all, are all these terpenes equal? Because when I get handed CO2 pens that are uh, clearly uh, mixed with uh, terpenes that may be found on cannabis but were not derived from cannabis, like the delimonene thing, like when, when somebody handed me that and it tasted, oh yeah, wow, it tastes better than the CO2 oil did, um, but are these things equal? I mean, if we have terpenes that are honestly derived from cannabis, that's one thing because that's what's on the buds we smoke. But if we are now smoking, you know, essence of orange uh, degreaser from Florida chemists, I, I mean, I have to ponder. It, this isn't the same thing, is it? The molecules are the same molecules. I mean, again, whether or not they have some residuals from where they came from could determine whether or not they can be, you know, sweat it out as, oh, that limonene came from um, came from orange peels. I mean, you could talk to Horatio about this. Some of the um, low-level um, decontaminant or some of the uh, contamination products, hydroperoxides and whatnot, can be noxious materials. But again, I think you're just getting it like in, in too large a dose. It would be like standing right in front of the tuba and let the tuba play, you just get this huge dose of tuba as opposed to being in the back of the concert hall and listening to the tuba as it plays along with the rest of the orchestra, which is a completely different experience than sitting right next to the tuba and getting blasted out by the tuba, right? Really? Does that make sense? Absolutely, and, and you, I love your analogies of music, they're, they're just exactly right, but it's, it's, uh, the, Todd's also talking about this quality of the source material. I mean, certainly you can get aromatherapy oils from more natural sources and things, and they've got to be better to breathe than, than keyboard cleaner. I mean, you know, there's levels of limonene. So, yeah, and, and we're, we're sitting here at, at the chateau level of, of extracts and concentrates. You know, we're, we're talking in the cerebral levels, but you got to remember that there's a lot of people who the best thing they can get is some lousy CO2 extract with some keyboard cleaner put in it, you know. People actually do smoke this stuff. Yeah. So back to, you know, we need some regulation. So sorry to get slightly political again, but we need regulation for these things. You know, it's can't let uh, snake oil salesmen run around and poison us. It's not right. I, I asked Rob the terpene question about if we could use it as indicators of, uh, and go ahead. Tell well, what, what we're trying to do with the Phylos project is work uh, is genome sequencing, or uh, shall I say differences in the genome, the genetics, genetic content of different plants, different individuals, because that's what we're really looking at. Um, <clears throat> cannabinoids have been used for this for a long time. That, that was the chemo taxonomic marker that was first used. And then Lots of labs use that. And then Carl Hillig added to this in, uh, at Indiana University in the, in the early 20th century, published in 2004 and 5. And one of the characters he used besides cannabinoids and terpenoids, he used terpenoids as well, and he used also um, isozymes. These are enzyme variations. They're, they're the direct gene products or nearly direct gene products of... Uh, of genes, you know, they're the, they're the uh, molecules that do the active work, they express the genes. And he looked at variations in those. Another way of chemotyping or using chemicals to do taxonomy, chemotaxonomy. Now the new way, of course, is with the genome sequencing. 
But back to terpenes. Um, they are useful taxonomically. I can't steal other people's thunder, and they haven't managed to publish yet, so I'll just hint around. But there are terpene classes that have been identified. These are looking at the major terpenes, not the entire profile, but the most prominent terpenes in, in each group. Um, how much can I say here without saying too much? Um, they're heritable. It's all very interesting, and a paper will be out soon that talks about this. Um, on the other hand, for taxonomic use, they're very difficult for the same reasons Horatio and everybody's explaining about differences in grow room, part of a grow room being hotter or colder or whatever. The, the profiles of terpenes probably don't change as much as the absolute amounts, but the problem with that is terpenes are a varying volatility, so profiles change if all the monoterpenes are gone. You know, okay, but you're, but you're more likely to see that you have the same general profile, at least of the prominent cannabinoids, and the other ones vary more by epigenetic, environmental, whatever reasons. But so for taxonomic characters, they're a little bit dodgy. Now, this won't be stealing anybody's thunder, and I waited today until to see if somebody from SC Labs came in, but they didn't. And uh, I have a very fascinating paper in my hand here that I would like to share with people. It's SC was involved, and so I was going to wait for them to get her, but it's really a, a paper primarily out of Nolan Kane and uh, Brian Lynch's lab at University of Colorado Boulder. They're genome guys, and they've managed to put together a number of data sets for uh, mostly drug varieties. Um, they have a few, one Chinese hemp variety, what would be broadleaf hemp maybe, um, sort of an outgroup in the, in the, uh, in the experiment. Um, They've done a really interesting job here. It's on a cursory level. It's hard to match data sets. Um, they're the first people to use the NLD, BLD um, nomenclature that, that Mark Rowland and I developed from Carl Hilling's work and John McPartland's and others. And uh, it's interesting to see that more of a genome look at uh, the taxonomy rather than just individual relationships. So this, this is a cool paper. And uh, Steep Hill did the analyses of cannabinoids and terpenoids in uh, many of the samples, and that was it was taken into account also. So back to the use of terpenes in taxonomy. It's the latest overlay of the paper. It, it, it mentions relationships rather than uh, general relationships rather than fine-tuning things. So that, that's kind of where we're at with terpenes, taxonomy, and things. This paper is called uh, Genomic and Chemical Diversity in Cannabis. Just came out last week, and it is. Ooh, it's put on bio. Bio R fourteen preprint. I'm not sure what journal this is actually in. This is a preprint copy. It's a manuscript copy. I'll uh, I'll leave. Anyway, you'll find it. just just search genomic and chemical diversity in cannabis. What's the quotes around it? You'll find it. It's Ryan Lynch, L-Y-N-C-H, is uh, the primary author. Nolan Kane is the last author. It's his lab. So, yeah, it's good stuff. And this is, this is all these labs are doing this. We had this tremendous, Mogley and I gave our, our little presentation about taxonomy and, and the Phylos project. And then Mogley and I sat the next day on Sunday on what they call the genetics um, panel discussion. Um, Moderated by Michael Bacchus, uh, a real smart guy, and one of his colleagues, Brian uh, Lee, was sitting on the panel as well, another real smart guy, and a breeder, and uh, known as Chimera to many of you. And uh, also on this panel were some three really awesome guys. There's Mowgli Holmes from Phylos Bioscience, there's John Page from um, University of British Columbia, and uh, I believe we got the affiliations right. And uh, Kevin McKernan from Medicinal Genomics. These are all three more extremely bright guys, and they're all working hands-on with uh, with the cannabis genome. I wish we'd invited uh, Nolan Kane as well. Um, there was a really good level of science on, on many fronts at the uh, Emerald Cup this year. It was really refreshing to see there are a lot of panels about serious things, uh, not just political, which is a big issue in California right now, but also the the science front. What these guys basically explained was that it's not a big search for genes, at least not within this group. 
it, it's not a big search for intellectual property. There will come a time when you can patent cannabis plants in America under the system we already have. There may come a time before that when our industry develops its own patenting system. But that's not what this is about. What this is about is making um, gene sequences from cannabis, <coughs> excuse me, gene sequences from cannabis open source to, make, to bring them into the public domain. This is what's happened naturally for years and years. Growers are proud, breeders are proud of their new varieties, and they share them with their friends. That instantly makes them public domain. There are very few cannabis varieties that people have kept close to the chest, whose wives have said to them 10 years ago, don't give this to anybody. You know, whatever. All well meant, all very good. Um, thank you, Chuck. Um, but that's not what this is about. What we're about is making it public domain so that it's everybody's, not anybody's. It, meaning that it's for the entire community and nobody can cubbyhole that and say, it's mine only. And that could be anybody. That could be agribusiness, that could be big pharma, as people choose to call it, or it could be you, you know, the breeder, some individual person. That's a very sticky, um, difficult, slippery slope, really. It uh, takes a lot of money to defend your intellectual property rights through the patenting system. And long and short of it, if a big company wants to steal it from you, you can't really outgun them anyway. They have more resources than you do. So a better way to protect is what was be presently being called defensive intellectual property rights protection. And that is uh, nearly free. You just submit varieties to a group that is going to publish those sequences. Um, any one of these groups might be able to, to help you with that. Um, Phylos Bioscience certainly is. We're uh, also sponsoring something called the Open Cannabis Project, and that is exactly that, an open forum for, uh, for not only publishing gene sequences, but also discussing sticky issues like what is a Kush or things of this nature. And with more... Uh, Genetic evidence, we have more, more ways to entertain this discourse about what varieties are. And it's, uh, I'd also like to see something that's all suggested openly now. I don't see why not. It's not that big an idea. I'd like to see a forum um, set up by the, the Open Cannabis Project that is set up like hash church because this works so well. This is brilliant. You, you begin possibly with people weighing in maybe uh, – Sam the Skunk Man can talk about what skunk number one is, you know, some knowns, as you would say in a scientific experiment. Ease into this, you know. Talk about the haze. Talk about some other ones that are older building blocks, things where the histories are quite known, or if they're controversial, at least they can be resolved by somebody who was there, you know, something like that. So a forum like this would be good. It would keep people from uh, getting in fights in the back of the room, and once that uh, people see what's going on with the old standard varieties and uh, maybe a few land race discussions even, then you can get into the fuel, you know, you can get into the fire, you know, and all this stuff you guys are all wise, you know, whizzed out about. So, yeah, that's it. That's uh, pretty much the intellectual property rights thing, some terpenes, and that's it. Thank you. All right, and two, Rob's only here for a couple more hours, and he flies away, so he made his flight later so he could join us, which I thought was cool, so... Well, thank you so much, Rob and Todd. Always appreciate when you uh, help bring those guys in, when you help facilitate them to be able to be here. I really do appreciate it, and I know everyone else does as well. He's going to come say goodbye to you. That's great. Hey, hey, my pleasure to be here. A little bit rough voice today. Yeah. Always good. Maybe next Sunday, too. We'll see. I hope so. Hope it would be great. That. And uh, we'll try to keep the conversation up to par. For Baba Rob. Sorry, man. Okay. It's a high level of knowledge. It's excellent. Very good.